Welcome to Conversations with your lovable, never pisses anyone off, ex-Muslim host Ina, keeping it non-controversial. Hello everyone, it's me, your friendly neighborhood IDW watcher, reporting from the front lines of the battle of ideas for another Patreon-exclusive episode. Well, actually, I'm wondering whether I should eventually release this to the public because I feel like as many people as possible should hear this because the Sam Harris episode I'll be discussing was just such utter trash. It'd be good to have a detailed dissection available to the public. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, if you're a patron listening, maybe leave a comment to help me decide. If you're a non-patron listening, well, I guess we made it public. But look at the kind of stuff you're potentially missing. Sign up on Patreon today to support the show. All right, let's get to it. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, do we have some absolute garbage ideas to discuss here. The Dumpster Fire, that is Sam Harris's rebranded and very popular podcast, which he's decided to call making sense has been making no sense at all, funnily enough. I'm sure many of you have by now heard or heard of this episode titled Some Thoughts on White Supremacy. I've seen a lot of people talking about just how awful it was, and thankfully more and more people are quote-unquote waking up to his bullshit now. I mean, it's hard not to at this point, right? He seems to be left with the most tribal, dogmatic, right-wing fans that are perhaps too embarrassed to admit they're right-wing, and so they hide behind the IDW label. Sam has become the new Dave Rubin, basically. Someone so utterly intellectually dishonest and such a biased hack, all the while patting himself on the back for being a truly rational thinker who works so hard to overcome his biases. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, Dave reached a critical mass of mockery where it's become accepted knowledge, even among cringeworthy IDW and Quillette fans, that Dave is not an intellectually honest actor. I'd love that same level of awareness to happen for Sam, too. It's getting there, as even he knows, which is why he's fumbling with sloppy episodes like this one. (sighs) It's hard not to see that the entire IDW is pretty much different shades of Reuben at this point. Some just happen to hide their power level better than others. And the fact that I used to be a Sam fan and defender and bought into his flimsy excuses makes me feel sort of obligated to spend time debunking them or pointing them out and drawing attention to them. He has in interviews claimed that his critics are dishonest and don't even follow his work, otherwise they'd never think he could be motivated by bigotry. But it's because I was a previous fan and followed his work carefully that I feel like I can pick up on patterns and heresisms and plausible deniability tactics that he could fool a less experienced Sam Harris listener with. So I just want to put some of this stuff on record with specific examples, and this is why I do threads while listening to his podcast too, so others can reference them because it really just makes me mad that I fell for it and bought that it was just about secularism, and I want others not to. Anyhow, his usual anti-left stuff is what it is, but this episode, (laughs) it really reached a new low. In his mind, he's made an attempt with this to clean up the embarrassing mess that he made when talking about the Christchurch shooting a while ago and not knowing whether it was ideological or not, but he seems to have dug himself into a deeper hole. But I mean, come on, let's be charitable here for a second. How could anyone possibly tell? The shooter only had a fucking 74-page manifesto titled The Great Replacement, but that's all. I mean, sure, it echoed some of the ominous Muslim birth rate stuff we've seen from Harris himself, and also the London is no longer white enough stuff from Sam's pal Doug Murray. It was filled with anti-immigrant, white nationalist, anti-Muslim references, cited Anders Breivik, declared support for Trump, but how can we tell it's not just shitposting? LOL. I mean, not like shitposting can be mixed with ideology or anything. It's just so hard to tell what the shooter was motivated by when 51 Muslims are gunned down in a mosque. And the explicit manifesto is anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim. And the trolling music the shooter played just happens to be a celebration of 
genocide against Bosnian Muslims. It's so hard to tell. What could his motivations have been? Guess we'll never know, right? Jesus. I'm amazed at how he can put this stuff out publicly without feeling embarrassed. I guess when you're that biased and blinded by ideology, you just can't see how terrible and ridiculous you look in trying to desperately spin things to your narrative. So I'm just going to go through and play some of the clips of his latest episode and respond to them. And honestly, I had a hard time just picking these clips because I feel like every single word he uttered was excruciatingly stupid and needed to be pushed back on. But alas, there's only so much time in a day. And interestingly, there's just been a new study out, too, that the IDW has got their intellectual undies in a bunch over. I'll link it in the notes. It's one that tracks the IDW to alt-light to alt-right pathway. Hmm, Sam Harris denying the seriousness of the white supremacy problem in an era where the president is basically a white supremacist sympathizer? After two out of three recent mass shootings had explicitly white supremacist motives and manifestos, however could the IDW lead one to overlaps with the alt-right, I wonder? And before this study, there was also the New York Times article with former extremist Caleb Kane, who also talked about the IDW being a part of the radicalization process. Here's a quote from a Rolling Stone article on this new study. After looking at more than 79 million comments on hundreds of thousands of videos, they found that, as Ribeiro puts it, there is migration among users from the alt-light and the IDW to the alt-right, confirming that less extreme right-wing content did indeed serve as a gateway of sorts for radicalization. And also, there's another great article in the Washington Post I just read yesterday comparing the gaslighty IDW conversations about race and IQ type stuff couched in science and rationality and how this conversation needs to keep happening because they actually have people of color's best interests in mind to the rhetoric in the South used to defend slavery in the past. I'll link that article too. Do give it a read. It's pretty chilling. Here's a little sample quote. Pro-slavery rhetoricians talked little of slavery itself. Instead, they anointed themselves the defenders of reason, free speech, and civility. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Yikes. Okay, back to Sam denying the seriousness of white supremacy. When he's not tweeting links to things confirming his narrative about this being the least racist time in America, he's recording the types of episodes I'll be discussing here. And it boggles my mind. Why would he do this to himself? Over and over and over again. Make himself look so ludicrous. So tone deaf. Trying to deny something that is so obviously a massive issue right now. Increasing in urgency by the day. He looks no better than the religious apologist defending terrible scripture that he's mocked for years, really. You see... When he himself is part of the group that's been shown with empirical evidence now to be a gateway to radicalizing people to the alt-right, he has a vested interest in downplaying or denying the seriousness of white supremacy. We can all see that now, yeah? Well, at least more of us can. Okay, get your gravel ready or whatever your preferred anti-nausea medicine is and let's dig into these nuggets of brain geniusness. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, well, it seems like I got into trouble in a housekeeping <laughs> I did for the Judea Pearl podcast. Uh, I recorded that in the immediate aftermath of the mass shootings in the U.S. in El Paso and Dayton. Many people sent me emails and tweets suggesting that I look at my subreddit, which apparently has been going haywire for quite some time. I think <laughs> half the people in my subreddit despise me. Half the people in my subreddit despise me. Half the people in my subreddit despise me. <laughs> it's turning into Dave Rubin's subreddit. Totally. So it's a perpetual state of war there. But my comments on the mass shootings and white supremacy, white nationalism, racism, etc., seem to have 
cause people to go fairly berserk there. So I looked into this. I don't usually look at Reddit. I couldn't get very far. I mean, honestly, it was like looking at one's own colonoscopy <laughs> if done by a madman. <laughs> it was not a pretty sight. I wonder what the colonoscopy was like this time around for this episode. One thing that people seem to have taken issue with and widely misunderstood... Sam Harris being misunderstood? What? ...was my claim that Trump's go-back-to-your-own-countries tweets were not clear signs of his racism. Go-back-to-your-own-country is like the most classic racist thing you can say. No, I've, I've long said that I have no doubt that Trump is racist. But Sam's gonna split hairs here and say, yeah, 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 Trump is racist, but was this one classically racist thing that he said, was that really a clear sign of Trump's racism? No, not to Sam. But I've often said that we have to be precise in making these allegations, right? You see, this is about precision. Sam just cares about being precise. My problem with the left. My problem with the left. Blah, blah, blah. Obligatory problem with the left. My problem with the left is that it's finding evidence of racism everywhere, even where it manifestly does not exist. Yeah, this is such a great example, Sam. Like Trump telling four women of color to go back to where they came from. And here was a case in Trump's recent tweets against the so-called squad uh, where it was susceptible to other readings, right? <laughs> what the fuck? I'm just, I'm amazed. It's susceptible to other readings. And I thought it was counterproductive to seize upon these tweets as clear signs of his racism and indeed his white supremacy. This part coming up is just so typical Sam Harris. Again, I'm giving Trump the benefit of the doubt here. Of course. Which I think I should always do. Of because course. Because I despise the man. Mm -hmm. People often accuse me of claiming that I have no biases. <laughs> That's simply untrue. I have biases. Yeah, Sam, we know, we know. All your biases are with the left, of course. And you just somehow managed to rise above them. That's what a great man you are. I try to correct for them. Mm -hmm. Here's my bias. I find Trump to be one of the most repellent human beings I can think of. That is a significant bias. I should be bending over backwards <laughs> to give him the benefit of the doubt when there is a doubt. And the left should do likewise especially if they don't want four more years of Trump in office. You got that, lefties? You gotta be bending over backwards to give Trump the benefit of the doubt, or else you'll be responsible for making him win again. Not the people that vote for him, not the people that support him, not the rampant racism and white supremacy. It's you, not bending over backwards, to give Trump the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, this is what Trump tweeted. So interesting to see, quote, progressive Democrat congresswomen who originally came from countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world, if they even have functioning government at all, now loudly and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. But this already is viewing them as outsiders. How does he not see this? They're as American as anyone else. And that is the racism. Viewing them as the other. It doesn't get more typically racist than that. If that is not a clear sign to Sam, then nothing short of a KKK hood would be a clear sign. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-infested places from which they came? Then come back and show us how. Okay, well, the president is clearly expressing contempt for these four congresswomen and contempt for the countries he imagines they came from. Now, his error here, his main error, is that only one of them is an immigrant, Ilan Omar, from Somalia. And Somalia is precisely one of those countries that fits Trump's description here. But the fact that Trump was wrong about the other three congresswomen they're all natural-born U.S. citizens. That is being interpreted as a symptom of his racism. 
right? Go back to your own countries when, in fact, this is their country. I ascribe this to Trump's ignorance. He couldn't be... This is Ilhan Omar's country, too, even though she's an immigrant, Sam. ...bothered to figure out who these people were. He might not be able to name all four of them. I bet he knows Ilhan Omar. He knows AOC. Does he know Rashida Tlaib and Ayanna Presley? He commented on her not being allowed into Israel. Yes, he knows who she is. I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> it is easy to imagine that he just assumed they were all immigrants or was just speaking about Ilan Omar. And that still would be racism, Sam. Once again, this falls into the evil Chauncey Gardner framing. He is not playing four-dimensional chess. He's not a genius. He is a buffoon. Which is Sam's main issue with Trump. Time and time again, he frames his criticisms of Trump in terms of Trump's buffoonery and unpredictability. Either he's a balloon that's the air is coming out of, or he's a rhinoceros, or something like that. It's never like being appalled at his racism. There's never any sense of urgency about that. Even if he mentions it in passing, it isn't real shock and disgust. Sure, he's also a racist. You see, that secondary. Sure, he's also a racist. But again, this isn't clear evidence, in my view, of racism. Had these women come from Ireland, right, <laughs> at the height of the potato famine, this is gold. Trump could easily have said, go back to your own starving country and fix that before telling us how to run the greatest nation on earth. And there would have been no implication of racism. Really? Did he really just say that? I mean, it amazes me how ignorant he is. He's got a toddler's understanding of racism. It is so literalist and so basic. And maybe that's on purpose because he doesn't want to have a more nuanced and deeper understanding of racism because that would include more things. There's a long history of racist fear mongering against the Irish. There were no Irish need apply signs. There was fear mongering about them interbreeding with white women. There was like religious bigotry against them mixed with the racial bigotry. There were illustrations that depicted them as apes and gorillas. Like there's a long tradition of dehumanizing and not considering the Irish white. And these are times when maybe Sam would benefit from trying to understand lefty concepts a bit more. You know, the shifting concept of whiteness. Jews, Italians, and the Irish, they all kind of shifted from being considered the other into being considered white. And I just, I just cannot believe that he used the Irish as an example of it not being racist. There are articles upon articles and books about, you know, the Irish not being considered white. I just, I mean, why can't he use Google even? And if you've been playing Sam Harris Bingo right now, get your cards out because uh, you're about to check one off. The problem is the left is as fixated on race as the far right is. Of course. The obligatory equivalence. The left is uh, fighting racism and the far right is doing racism. So, of course, they're both, you know, equally fixated on race. Have you ever come across such superficial bullshit? I, I, I just, I don't know what to say without repeating myself over and over again. But this is, uh, this is shockingly bad. Even for Sam, it's shockingly bad. And you know that thing that he does about, oh, you know, I have biases that are with the left. He did that in his interview with Ezra Klein, too, when they were talking about Charles Murray and him maybe being biased towards that. He was all like, no, 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 no. My biases are with the left. It's just me correcting for my biases that I have to have these conversations. I mean, what a noble guy, right? He's just trying to go against his extremely SJW, extremely left-leaning biases. And that's why he says and does all these things. That's the basis for my demurral about Trump's tweets. He's an ignoramus and a blowhard and a bully. And again, these are issues that Sam has that are more important than Trump's racism. And sometimes that's the most parsimonious explanation for the chaos he causes. Mm -hmm. If some terrible person 
makes a valid point. I'm not going to pretend that he's wrong just because he's a terrible person. A logically or factually or even ethically true statement is no less true if a serial killer or a neo-Nazi or some other repellent person has observed it to be so. So this gets me into trouble occasionally. Surely, if someone repellent is making some point that's correct, you can find another source, a better person to elevate and prop up and promote and use for that point. And the fact that Sam Harris says this explains a lot, explains why, you know, he keeps propping up terrible people. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about white supremacy and jihadism and how I have spoken about each in the past. Just so there's no confusion here, I'll make a few declarative statements. Yeah, get that out of the way, Sam. Make sure you declare that you're against white supremacy. White supremacy is a real phenomenon. It is an ideology. Thanks for acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. And it is a source of violence. No question about that. It's just not a big problem, you see? Not like that jihadism stuff. The question is, how big a problem is it? How well subscribed is it? What exactly do white supremacists believe? Why do they believe it? What do they want to do? You see, this is his out. If he's called out on this bullshit, he's like, but I declare that white supremacy is a problem. This is him maintaining that little wiggle room that he likes to do so that he can walk back what's convenient to walk back. You know, I'm happy to take that point from Hitler himself if it's interesting. This Why? But why not find another source? Why? I just, I don't get it. Obviously, he is not a good faith actor. It's Hitler, for fuck's sake. You don't want to be taking any, but actually, point from Hitler. Now pay close attention to what he says next and remember that part. The source simply doesn't matter. The source simply doesn't matter, says the guy who was skeptical about allegations against Krauss, no matter how much detail they were described in, because they were in BuzzFeed News. Just just remember that, okay? The source doesn't matter, Sam Harris says. He'll even take that point from Hitler. That's just how rational he is and how much he won't let his biases get in the way. You know, I'm happy to take that point from Hitler himself if... It's interesting. The source simply doesn't matter. Anyway, this seems to be the kind of thing that can make people think that the mask is slipping, right? Or that I'm dog whistling in some way to extremists. Or that I have a secret affinity for white supremacists or racists or whoever. So this is kind of a straw man because he's framing it in a more extreme way. People don't usually think that Sam Harris is secretly dog whistling to extremists and terrorists to encourage them or anything. People think that Sam is just biased towards your average everyday racism and that makes him downplay the threat of white supremacy. Because let's face it, Average everyday racism and extreme white supremacy do have some overlaps, right? There's anti-immigrant rhetoric in mainstream conservatives and there's anti-immigrant white genocide rhetoric in mass shooters. These are the overlaps that people think leads from Sam Harris or other IDWers to the alt-right. So framing it in this extreme way to begin with is, is a way to be like, oh, this is so ridiculous. See, people think that, you know, my mask is slipping and I'm dog whistling to extremists when, when that's not what it is. Framing it in those terms is to make valid criticism of him seem absurd. Like just today, as I record this, he has posted an article by white genocide Doug Murray, who is, of course, totally unbiased and super rational and not a vile anti-immigrant, um, 
This article is titled The Truth About Hate Speech, and it argues that the types of views identified in a report as extremist and linked to far-right terrorists are actually not totally wrong. That is literally what this article is arguing, that we shouldn't be demonizing people with similar points to far-right terrorists. So that, Sam, is what people are talking about when they say your mask is slipping. Not that you're some secret uh, KKK guy. What percent of white people, however we define that group, are white supremacists or are fond of white supremacist organizations if they're not members themselves or would support them and who either publicly or privately celebrate their violence right so you hear that some white supremacist went into a mosque or a synagogue or a school and killed 20 people and left some manifesto online what percent of white people in the u.s say recognize that to be a valid expression of an ideology that they support to pick a concentric circle further out than that, what percent of white people are just not quite sure how they feel about it? They're kind of open-minded. You know, maybe that school did have to be shot up, right? Maybe those Jews in that synagogue said something that warranted their murder. How many people fall into that category? So again, this framing of the issue seems to be very deliberately crafted to minimize greatly the normalization of white supremacy. He asks, but doesn't have an answer to, what percentage of white people support this kind of stuff? And he gives a few extreme examples and says, who would celebrate that kind of violence or who would just be unsure about it? What he doesn't do is talk about crusader culture in the U.S. military, about how many people talk about killing hajis and their families and how their t-shirts sold that say nuke Mecca, how in 2015 public policy polling found that 30% of Republicans and 19% of Democrats were in favor of bombing the fictional city Agrabah from the animated movie Aladdin. It's not even a real city, and that's how normalized violence against the other is. He doesn't mention these things. He frames it in very narrow terms so that everything falls outside of that, so that he can purposely minimize just how widespread this problem of dehumanizing the other is, just how far this problem of white supremacy actually spreads if you look at it in a broader context. Racism and white supremacy evolves to, to conceal itself better in the system. There are white supremacists that wear suits, not hoods. Republican member of Congress Steve King openly asked why terms like white nationalists and white supremacists became offensive language. There's a white supremacist on national TV called Tucker Carlson. There's Laura Ingram, both who spread the same kind of white nationalist, anti-immigrant rhetoric that we see in these mass shooter manifestos. Don't tell me that that's fucking fringe. How many people fall into that category? And conversely, we should ask all these questions about jihadism, jihadist terrorism, and the full set of the world's Muslims, right? Now, I don't know the precise answers to these questions, but we have enough data to suggest that they're different. And I'll talk about why I think that is. I think that support for jihadism is far more common. There's a, there's a far greater percentage of the world's Muslims who acknowledge jihadism as legitimate, the killing of apostates and blasphemers, committing murder in defense of the faith as legitimate. And that's not an accident. Now, what that percentage is, again, I can't give you an exact number, but it's not 1%. It's not 2%. It's a far more disconcerting number than that. But if it were only 10% of the world's Muslims... So he doesn't have exact numbers to give us, but he knows that jihadism is way worse 
he doesn't mention any other factors that there's uh, poverty and crime related to that poverty. There's a lack of infrastructure. There's a lack of proper law and order and being able to enforce that law in many Muslim countries. Of course, there are, there are severe problems with extremism in the Muslim world, and I've been there to acknowledge that. I've been there to call it out. But what I didn't expect is when the tables were turned and it was time to acknowledge the issues that we're having with white supremacy over here in the West, that a lot of these people that I've respected as atheist thinkers and intellectuals would become the very apologists that we used to mock. We don't have precise numbers because it's hard to gauge what people are thinking. And in a Muslim country where people are punished for not adhering to what they're supposed to be thinking, they have serious, serious consequences. So how honestly do you think someone will answer uh, what should be done with apostates or what are your thoughts on homosexuality on a poll when they're fearing for their life? All these things should be taken into account when looking at those numbers. I mean, I am an apostate and an enthusiastic blasphemer, and I find Sam's rhetoric revolting and disingenuous and dishonest. The way that he's comparing and contrasting the two things is is just not accurate. He clearly has a vested interest in downplaying the awfulness of people in the in-group and exaggerating the awfulness of people in the out-group. It's likely that there's a much larger percentage of Muslims that have a literalist interpretation of scriptures than people who fall into white supremacy. But you also have to take into account the kinds of education and resources that they have available to them. When you're poor and you don't have much of an education and religiosity and literal interpretations of the Quran and Hadith are all that you've seen around you, you're much more vulnerable to falling into that. I'm not saying that a better education somehow completely makes you immune to extremism. I'm just saying that this is one factor. And Sam Harris has a history of being very narrow in the factors that he considers when it comes to Islamic extremism while being extremely charitable and bending over backwards, as we heard him say earlier, when it comes to white supremacists or racists or Western far writers like Trump or Douglas Murray or Lauren Southern or Anne Marie Waters or Tommy Robinson or any of the number of people that he's been defending or promoting or making excuses for on his very large platforms. But if it were only 10% of the world's Muslims that had a soft spot for jihadism, that would be an enormous problem. He has no specific numbers, but he's fear-mongering about 10%. If it were only 10%, it would be an enormous problem. That would be an enormous problem worth thinking about. That's a civilizational problem. Worth thinking about. I don't have the numbers, but it's worth thinking about. What if? That's a problem that probably exists in half the world's countries, if not more. What percentage of white people, again, I don't know how you define that, but anyone who could conceivably be a white supremacist, what percentage of white people have a soft spot for white supremacy? To be clear, this is not the same thing as asking what percentage of white people are a little racist. Of course, Sam is going to split all the hairs when it comes to racism and white supremacy, etc., uh, but we're not really talking about just a little racist here, are we, in these times? Sam is recording this very shortly after there have been two white supremacist-inspired far-right mass shootings. The level of obnoxiousness it takes to <laughs> record an entire episode downplaying the increasing problem of white supremacy, especially at this time, is just stunning. Stunning. And of course, he doesn't mention that after Charlottesville, a new ABC News and Washington Post poll found that 9% of people called it acceptable to 
hold neo-Nazi or white supremacist views, which is equivalent to about 22 million Americans. And a similar number, 10%, say they support the alt-right movement. So that's already a pretty massive, massive number. He doesn't mention these numbers, though. It's all very vague, and uh, what percent do you think it is? Are there people who recognize in themselves racial bias who are absolutely appalled by ideological racism. Just as there are Muslims who take Islam seriously who are appalled by jihadism, right? And appalled by a group like ISIS. Certainly that's got to be a majority of Muslims. Otherwise, the game would be over. Well, at least he grants that. So what percentage of white people in the U.S. do you think sort of like the neo-Nazis, the KKK, or other white supremacist groups, or are poised to join them. Again, I don't know the data on this. I don't know that we can trust the data on this. <laughs> so he says he doesn't know the data on this. And even if he did, he doesn't know that we can trust the data on this. Now go back to what he said a little while ago about even taking a point from Hitler if he's saying the right thing, you know? The source doesn't matter. Remember that? Now, all of a sudden, when it comes to data on white supremacy, Sam doesn't know if he can trust the data. Convenient, that. It's unfortunate that some of the groups whose job it is to give us data of this sort have now proven themselves to be totally unreliable. Yes, they made a mistake uh, by putting Majid on that list at that time. I also argued in favor of Majid not being on that list. Since then, Majid has become way worse, but I still think that there's definitely a difference between him and Pam Geller and Robert Spencer. But yes, okay, they got one thing wrong. I thought you, Sam, were the guy who would take a point from Hitler. Hitler got a few things wrong too, you know? Now, all of a sudden, we just can't trust the SPLC forever because they got the thing about Majid wrong. Now, all their data on white supremacists and white supremacist groups is completely unreliable. The Southern Poverty Law Center has just immolated itself by more or less calling everyone in sight a neo-Nazi. That's nonsense, and you know it. They have not called everyone in sight a neo-Nazi, and they didn't even call Majid Nawaz a neo-Nazi. As you might remember, they called my friend Majid Nawaz an anti-Muslim extremist. Which is not neo-Nazi. And increasingly, he's been palling around with more and more anti-Muslims, making excuses for people like Lauren Southern, saying Katie Hopkins is the left's monster, telling Imam of Peace that he's been following him with great interest and would like to meet him. Majid's definitely been getting worse. Did, did the SPLC get the timing of that and the framing of that exactly spot on? No, no, I don't think that they did. But is Majid becoming more and more concerning? Yes, yes, he is. Now, I will grant you, we are just one large incident away from being convinced that white supremacy is a major problem. One large incident away? I don't know what he's waiting for. Like, there have been many shootings and attacks and foiled plots and neo-Nazis found with weapons and, and Nazis mowing people down with cars. I don't know what it would take to convince Sam Harris that this is a major problem. He's recording this after two such shootings. How large should they have been? If we had another bombing the size of Oklahoma City now in the current environment, there's no question white supremacy would be our foremost concern. Okay, so it has to meet Sam's ridiculous bar. White supremacy would be our foremost concern, at least for a while. And that's regardless of how many people we think are actually involved in it. But it's an empirical question to determine how many people are sympathetic with this ideology. He says it's an empirical question, but he's already said he doesn't think that we can trust the data on this. 
So he's already planted the seed of doubt in the minds of his massive, massive audience. And next, he says something to give himself a little wiggle room, as per usual. So let me first admit that I could be wrong about this, right? My intuitions could be wrong. My reading of the news could be biased. But I believe that while it's scary, white supremacy is still the fringe of the fringe in the United States. <laughs> fringe of the fringe. I mean, I, I think I did a Rational Man uh, comic strip on this fringe of the fringe nonsense. <laughs> Just to say this in the Trump era is mind boggling to me. How does he not see how ridiculous that sounds? I mean, fuck. I'm speechless. Honestly, I am. When you're a white man, you're not in the best position, maybe, to gauge how threatening white supremacy is. You're not the target of it. And it's not as scary to you, obviously, as it is to someone who is a visible minority, someone who can easily be targeted while walking down the street. And a better person would acknowledge that, would acknowledge that they are not in the best position to gauge the severity of this issue. But not our brain genius, Sam Harris. He speaks with such authority on how racism is not such a big deal and how this is like the least racist time in America. It's just stunning. I'm accused of being a white supremacist, right? or of dog whistling to white supremacists. Here he is with that hyperbolic framing again. Most reasonable and legit criticism of Sam isn't putting him in a KKK hood. It's saying that he's got overlapping talking points with some nasty alt-right stuff, like him fear-mongering about Muslim birth rates and calling them ominous. Like the clip from my podcast where he said, hang on, let me just play that clip for you guys. Anne-Marie thinks you're pro-rape of white women if you're not anti-immigration uh, or prepared to let rape happen. And uh, but, but she the, thinks that... But the problem, I mean, again, the, the, I mean, the, this, is, this is an area where we're in, you know, it, it, this is a gray area in the sense that, you know, she's right. When you look at what's happened in Europe in the last 12 months, you have a lot, <laughs> of, you have a lot of people on the left who are prepared to let white women get raped by Muslim immigrants. What I mean, the there fuck? Are, there, are, there are people who are prepared to be raped themselves. What the fuck? What the fuck? Every time I hear that, I'm like... Oh. This fear-mongering about Muslim men or, you know, men of another race raping white women. This is like... A white supremacist trope as old as time. And when he says shit like this, of course people are going to think he's dog whistling. Of course people are going to think that he has some overlapping sympathies. When he does shit like that time and time again, when he elevates far riders, when he makes excuses for them, when he threatens to quit Patreon over them getting banned, that is what makes people think he's sympathetic. People aren't really thinking that he's secretly, you know, some grand wizard. Or of dog whistling to white supremacists. That's the level of the criticism here. Or not being worried about white supremacy because I'm a racist who sort of agrees. Ding, 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 ding. That's the one. With their whole program. Well, first of all, I'm Jewish, right? And I've received death threats from white supremacists. Okay, so take that data point into consideration for a moment. So the idea that I'm constitutionally disinclined to worry about white supremacy is fairly crazy. No, it's not, actually. There are Jewish members and Muslim members and members of color of the modern alt-right. There's Dave Rubin, who is a far-right propagandist who uses the same exact talking point that, oh, he's gay and Jewish. There's Milo, who is exposed to have neo-Nazi ties and sympathies. 
this this doesn't disqualify anyone. It's not crazy at all. You don't understand the modern intersectional far right if you think that being Jewish or being Muslim disqualifies someone from having far right sympathies. I can't believe the day has come where Sam Harris is using the day of Reuben, but I'm a Jewish gay married man point to deflect from very valid criticism. But here we are. There are real eliminationist white supremacists spread throughout the world. The question is, how many of them are there? And how likely are they to be able to do what they want to do? And my reading of the current moment is that there are not so many of them, and they're not very likely to do what they want to do. So this is what Sam does best. He acknowledges that there's a problem. Of course white supremacy is a thing. Of course it can be bad and there are eliminationist white supremacists. But then he jumps right to downplaying it. But there just aren't that many and their ideology isn't likely to attract too many people. So it's not a big problem. But it's there. His condemnation is there for anyone who says that he doesn't acknowledge white supremacy or he doesn't call it out enough. He's put it in there. And that is a heresism. In order to make white supremacy like jihadism, you'd have to do a few things. First, you would have to make it a religion, a real religion, not just like a religion. <laughs> because, of course, if it's bad, it's got to be religion. You would have to make it a doctrine set among other doctrines that promised its adherents everything they could possibly want in the next life. So there he is signaling the martyrdom jihadist thing. So he basically wants to make it literally the same thing, and that's only when he would worry about it just as much. Why, though? I don't understand. Things outside of religion can be incredibly dangerous, and white supremacists, white nationalists, they have their own texts that they're inspired by. Why does that not count? Just because it's not from the divine? How many theists are there that cherry pick that read scripture and reinterpret it according to their own more modern lens, something that, you know, some of us may consider even intellectually dishonest when talking about scripture as, oh, it was totally not homophobic or sexist. It was actually just misinterpreted. Theists do that all the time. Why then does it have to be actual scripture for it to be a threat? People can be influenced by things that are not scripture, right? We've seen manifesto after manifesto quoting far-right texts. I mean, this is just such lazy and childish thinking. It's, it's bizarre. Why can you not see past religion bad? So what you'd have to have is a whole doctrine around white superiority. You'd have to spell it all out in the words of God. Why? Clearly, people are inspired to murder outside of getting commands from God. It's happening around you. The people who quote FBI data and say that white supremacy is a greater threat to Americans than jihadist terrorism because more people have been killed by white supremacist terrorism than jihadist terrorism in recent years. Well, okay, that's fine. It's a little fishy that they always start counting after September 11th, right, in order to make the numbers work. Well, no, September 11th was almost two decades ago. It's not to discount it, but they perhaps just use it as a marker. It's not some scheme to make the numbers work. I like how the FBI numbers themselves are now fishy. It could be asked just as easily why someone wants to count an attack from almost two decades ago to make their preferred numbers work, to make their narrative work. And then he goes on to discuss the specifics of suicide attacks and martyrdom when that's really just one tactic of terrorism, right? If it's not exactly like jihad down to the letter, it's not as great a problem. Given what I believe to be the differences between jihadism and white supremacy as doctrines, and the differences between the cultures surrounding these doctrines. 
Ah, yes, the cultures. It's that Muslim culture, you see, that's the problem. The differences between the, the standing of these doctrines in the background culture of each group. The standing that Sam does not make clear. The normalization of white supremacy that Sam does not count. I believe the percentages of people in each category who join those groups will be very different. Again, this is an empirical question. I One that you cast doubt on the data of. Could be wrong about this. There's that wiggle room. But the fact that I believe that this difference exists explains why I treat these phenomena differently. And then the thing I said that got me into trouble in this housekeeping surrounds the, the gamification and trolling component of some of these recent attacks. The Christchurch shooter live-streamed his attack from a helmet cam to make it look like a, a first-person shooter game, and he had a, a soundtrack playlist for his killing spree. A song in which celebrated Bosnian Muslim genocide. For his viewers, I believe the El Paso shooter also had a playlist. When I spoke about this before and, and speaking about it now, I, I do not consider myself sufficiently well-informed to have a strong opinion about this. So when I when I spoke about this in my housekeeping, I was saying, this might be so, This it seems that this is the case in certain cases. I mean, I was, it was, I was super provisional. You influence a lot of people and you plant certain ideas in their heads. It doesn't matter how many buts or it seems that you say you are leading people in a certain direction. Please hear what I'm saying now in that spirit. This is not totally understood, right? Who is a real white supremacist and who is a lunatic who is trolling? There are suicidal, psychopathic, incel nutcases spending all their time on 4chan and 8chan hoping to kill people. So where does that psychopathology and utter wastage of a human mind become real ideological white supremacy? That 4chan trolling mentality can be, and often is, mixed with ideology. The way these things are carried out evolve with time, with the political climate, with the generation, with the culture that they're immersed in. Of course, they're going to adapt it to what they're used to. And if online culture is what they're used to, or if jihadism, or if religious culture is what they're used to, that's how it will be carried out. And what is a manifesto that attests to one and not the other? It's just an open question in certain cases. And I honestly don't know. Why not both? Why do you have to take jihadists at their word when you're reading from their propaganda magazines, but the manifesto? Well, it's a question, right? It's a question of what part is trolling and what part is sincere belief. It's amazing, the double standard. I'm going to actually play for you Sam Harris from that episode where he read from the ISIS magazine. Just spot the differences in how he talks about the inspiration behind jihadist terror and what he's saying here about white supremacists and 4chan terror and it maybe not being sincere and what is the line and how do we know? Okay, so this is episode number 43 called What Did Jihadists Really Want? where he reads from the ISIS magazine Dabiq. So why do jihadists do what they do? Well, they are telling us ad nauseum. They're telling us even when we don't ask. And a magazine like Dabiq advertises their concerns and aspirations with utter clarity. And you might want to say it's just propaganda. And it is propaganda. But it only works as propaganda because many Muslims share these aspirations and concerns and believe the same doctrines. To call it propaganda doesn't mean that it's dishonest. To call it propaganda doesn't mean that it's dishonest. For these ideas to successfully recruit people means that they find these ideas compelling. So whether Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi believes every word in this magazine isn't the point. The point is that this material is a highly successful means of recruiting foreign-born jihadis. The point is that many people find these ideas persuasive, and that's not an accident. 
Contrast this with the constant minimization of white supremacy and saying that those ideas are not likely to persuade a lot of people, that they're a fringe of the fringe, and the constant suggestions of them not being sincerely held ideas, of them being just trolling, and how it has to be one or the other. And Oh, he had a playlist? Oh, well, I guess now we have to doubt whether it was white supremacist inspired or not. Here's a bit more from that What Did Jihadists Really Want episode. And this is spelled out in great detail in a magazine that prominently celebrates the indiscriminate slaughter of innocent people. To read this magazine is to discover that the oft-mocked line that was delivered by George Bush in his Texas drawl, they hate us for our freedom, is actually true. It is especially true if you include freedom of speech and belief. And those among you who think that they must have some other motive, that they must hate us for our foreign policy, as any rational people would in the aftermath of colonialism, well, you're simply wrong, and dangerously so, as they make absolutely clear. You hear that? Every other motivation that's not in this ISIS propaganda magazine, which you have to take at its word, is wrong. And dangerously wrong, according to Sam Harris. But all the Great Replacement and White Nationalist manifestos, who can know what they really mean? Now let's jump back to the thoughts on white supremacy episode. Just for contrast. This is not totally understood, right? Who is a real white supremacist and who is a lunatic who is trolling? There are suicidal, psychopathic, incel nutcases spending all their time on 4chan and 8chan hoping to kill people. So where does that psychopathology and utter wastage of a human mind become real ideological white supremacy? And what is a manifesto that attests to one and not the other? It's just an open question. It's just an open question. How do we know? And I honestly don't know enough about the Christchurch case to know what is what. And he honestly just doesn't know enough about the Christchurch case that killed 51 Muslims that had an explicit anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant manifesto titled The Great Replacement to know what's what. He just doesn't know. He goes on to read some cherry-picked quotes. While, of course, he's discredited FBI data, any information you might get from the SPLC, but he's totally uh, happy to read from articles and quotes that fit his spin. This is part of the quote that he's reading. Wonder why he picked it. That's going to frame the conversation in their terms. It's going to go along with their game. They become the center of the universe and everyone else revolves around them. It's not a good faith document. It isn't information that is sincerely offered. It is manipulation that is deliberately forwarded in the hopes that journalists will report it verbatim, will dissect it for days and weeks and months and years, says Phillips. There's an awareness of the audience, and that should make us very, very suspicious of anything that's in those documents. Okay, so this is what scholars of this phenomenon are saying. Of course, there's a trolling element. Of course, there's an online culture element. But that doesn't mean that the ideology behind it is not sincerely white supremacist. The fact he's trying to spin this so hard, it's it's obvious where his biases lie. Now, Eric Harris... I think in his journals, went on and on about his own white supremacy. But there are very few people who seriously think that Columbine was a white supremacist terrorist atrocity. Eric Harris was a seriously disturbed young man. As far as I understand, the fact that he was into white supremacy wasn't especially relevant to what he did. So I honestly don't know what is the case with some of these specific attacks. Are you hearing this shit? I mean, he is, he's talking about the Columbine shooting to downplay the very clear white supremacist motivations of the recent shootings. They have manifestos. They have spelled out their reasons. The Columbine shooter may have held white supremacist beliefs, but it's clear that that school shooting wasn't inspired by white supremacy. To conflate these two things is so dishonest. I know he knows that. 
This isn't just stupidity or a, a, a slip up on his part. He's doing this purposely, surely, to try and muddy the waters. Disgusting. Honestly, disgusting. And I believe the Dayton case is now seemingly a leftist attacker, right? How easy it is for him to say leftist attacker when I don't think we've still seen anything about the Dayton shooter being inspired by leftist ideas. The amount of intellectual dishonesty here. It's, this is why I had to do this episode. I had to do this breakdown because it's just infuriating to hear the number of things that he's conflating, the both sidesing of the far right and the left, and the denial of the obvious parallels between white supremacist radicalization and jihadist radicalization. There's so much going on here. I hope that I've helped to break down some of it, but there's just endless layers to how much bullshit there is over here. This is like right-wing propaganda. This is like Fox News Tucker Carlson bullshit to call the Dayton shooter a leftist attacker. And I just can't believe that someone that I used to admire is doing that. This podcast might become almost entirely focused on the problem of white supremacy at some point in the future. <laughs> yeah, right. He's putting it out there because, you know, it just might happen if white supremacy ever became like a serious problem, but that time just isn't right now. But there's a difference between the two that seems important to me now, and it's that perception of difference that determines how I speak about these things. That's right. You heard it here, folks. White supremacy isn't important enough to focus on right now in the aftermath of multiple mass shootings. But, you know, the blue-haired college kids and political correctness, that is totally a great threat and something worth focusing on. Okay, last point. We have a man who visibly lacks a conscience in everything he does running the country. And it is sickening. But in response to that, we have a left that is filled with liars and dupes. And that is also sickening. <laughs> of course, of course. Sam Harris has to uh, both sides, the left and uh, Trump. We have a left that will say that the president never condemned white supremacy and that he talked about good people on both sides. This is a Prager U talking point, is it not? I believe... Sean did an entire video debunking this, and I'll link it in the show notes. You can just watch that. Now we're at the point where um, Sam Harris and PragerU are making the same points. Yikes. Where when you actually watch the video, he did condemn white supremacy. And his good people on both sides comment, while it is endlessly recycled in the media at the highest level, on CNN, in the New York Times, from the mouths of the current Democratic candidates for the presidency, with a modicum of charity or just basic grammar, you can see that he was referring to not white supremacists, but other people who were at those demonstrations, people who didn't want the statues in Charlottesville torn down. Here's a short clip from Sean's excellent video, but basically... It goes like this. Second reason that Trump was criticized after this press conference is that the claim that there were some fine people at the Unite the Right rally peacefully protesting the removal of the statue is ridiculous and incorrect. There were not fine people at the rally. It was explicitly organized as a white supremacist neo-Nazi rally. Nazi iconography was everywhere. The listed speakers were white supremacists and neo-Nazis. It was organized by white supremacists and neo-Nazis. There was absolutely no confusion about who these people are or what they believe. Yes, the cats, right? yes. Yes. So I'll just end here with Sam sounding like Prager you, And that's all for today. Thanks for listening, folks. I hope that if you share my frustrations on this topic, that this was a helpful episode. 
Thanks for your support, dear patrons. And if we've made this a public episode and you're a non-patron listening to this, do consider supporting the podcast. Without you, this show isn't possible. (laughs) 